Hello, I'm Roger Bradford. In this talk, I'm going to be discussing lessons learned over the past 20 years in building large information systems. In particular, I'm going to be describing uh, experience gained in building 63 of these systems that included the technique of latent semantic indexing as a key technical feature. Now, the technique of LSI is well known, so I'm not going to spend much time on this, but basically, you have a cl collection of documents containing text of interest, you parse through the documents, create a term document matrix, and apply the technique of singular value decomposition to re-express that matrix as a product of three matrices, one of which is diagonal in the singular values. We then keep just the top few hundred singular values and set all the rest to zero. And after that, we create a, a a vector space greatly reduced dimensionality in which the terms and documents are represented by vectors in that space. And the beauty of the technique is in that space, the proximity of two vectors in that space turns out to be a very good approximation of human judgment of semantic similarity for the, for the items represented by those vectors. And that's well documented in the LSI literature. There's over 100 reports that have been done where researchers have taken a gold standard test set and have used that set to test both LSI and humans on various tasks. This slide shows a summary of those experiments. And as you can see, LSI has outperformed human performance or equaled it in more than half of all the cases. And that's pretty impressive because there's no advanced techniques being used in any of these tests. They're all basically LSI as it was known 20 years ago. And in general, they've used quite small test sets, on average less than 10,000 documents. And that's a bit of a problem because LSI performance depends on the size of the, of the test collection from which the space is built. So this is a graph of performance for a particular technical metric that's described in the paper. And we've done many others like this with other technical metrics and also with uh, actual performance metrics for the applications we're dealing with. And most of them look like this and they tend to have the same type of uh, structure. The trend curve here is logarithmic and in general that's what we see. And unfortunately, in the LSI area, there's a big gap between what's done commercially and what's in the LSI literature. So it's a very thin band on the left side of this graph you may not even be able to see. It's basically the domain of the LSI literature. 97% of all technical publications ever published on LSI use text collections that are smaller than that second dot on the graph there. So when somebody says, well, this technique was tried, they performed better than LSI, almost always they're comparing performance to LSI in a situation where the text collection is not nearly large enough for it to really perform well. Now this chart shows one of the biggest stories over the past 20 years, the reduction in the amount of time required to create an index for a given collection of documents. So this is the time required to create an LSI index for a million documents using the computers of the time frame. And you can see 20 years ago, we used clusters of processors and would wait tens of hours to have an LSI space constructed. The last spot dot on the curve is for a, for a Dell laptop that was creating full LSI indexes a million document collections in tens of minutes, and that was five years ago. So historically, it was concerned about how computationally intensive LSI is, but in fact, that's no longer uh, a problem. This slide shows the uh, sizes of the 63 systems, the sizes of the text, test collection, text collections that were used to create the LSI indexes, and there's a steady progression in size. On the left-hand side of the graph, there are systems we built 10 to 20 years ago. They were all single-digit millions of documents that were being used. All the systems in the last 10 years basically are in the tens to hundreds of millions of documents. And again, the LSI literature is off to the left in the slide that over the years I've amassed a collection of over 3,000 technical documents on LSI. And in all of those, only tens would actually even show up on this graph based on the size of the text collections that were employed. Over the years, not only did the systems we build increase in size, but also in sophistication. So in the early years, we did some very simple things. One of the first systems we built was for comparing resumes or job descriptions. So a very simple document to document comparison, but it worked very well. Over time, we went to more complex things, working with entities, relationships, events, and complex constructs of user interests and user knowledge. And over time, we were able to do more and more advanced applications, particularly discovery applications like fraud detection and biomedical discovery.
Now, in the paper, I described several different technical techniques that allowed us to improve the systems over time. In this uh, talk, I picked a three ones I think are most important to talk about. First one's named entities. Now, this is really critical to our success. Uh, if you build one of these systems and you use classical LSI, then you can have a user interface where you can say to a user, if this is the, top of the uh, term you're interested in, then here are the most closely associated terms. Well, in a big collection, the set of closely associated terms is kind of a large amorphous collection uh, that isn't that useful. When we do, as we did in virtually all these systems, we do entity extraction of the text, we mark it up, and we build the LSI space, we treat all the entities as units, then we can write software and build in interfaces such that someone can say, for example, here's, if this is an example of type of fraud you're interested in, then here's a ranked list of the people in the collection that you ought to be interested in. Now, even if you have an application where users aren't particularly interested in entities, there's a major fundamental problem of representational fidelity. In the large collections we're talking about in recent years, there are tens of millions of names of people. And if you go through the LSI space and when you're creating it, and you take every occurrence, let's say, of a common name like John, and you coalesce them all down to a single point, then you've made a lot of mistakes. And if you're doing that for the whole collection, the common names like Kim or Lee or Muhammad, you can end up making millions to tens of millions of mistakes in terms of false associations. You'll certainly corrupt all of those vectors. But in, in an LSI space, there's a delicate balance where basically everything depends on everything else. If you corrupt those vectors, you corrupt all of them. So this was one of the most important things that we did that resulted in the success of these systems. Another important thing was phrase processing. One of the historical complaints about LSI was you couldn't process phrases. And that's the problem because users are used to using phrases and there's good uses for them. And along the line, we figured out how to do that. And that uh, turned out to be a very good development. And that's, there's an example given in the paper and I provide a reference for it. And then finally, the third thing that we did that made a big difference uh, was novelty detection. So in these very large collections, uh, it's straightforward for a user to make a query. It's a perfectly reasonable query that brings back a result list consisting of thousands of documents. Now there's enormous duplication in those lists and there's enormous overlap with the knowledge the user already has. And so it's very, uh, very inefficient for a user to go down through a list of thousands of documents. So what we did in the best systems we built was to monitor user activity. Every time they would save a document or cut and paste from it, we'd save that information. Anytime they wrote a draft report or even made notes on something, we would take that information and we, we would construct a complex representation of their knowledge. Then we could take these long result lists and re-rank them. So we could say to users, these are the relevant documents, but they are being presented to you in the order in which they are least like what you already have seen, and therefore most likely to have new information. Another thing that we did along the line, we combined more and more capabilities that LSI could have uh, this is a good example. This was an application we did where we were ingesting hundreds of thousands of news items around the world every day. And we were going through a workflow where we did topical decomposition, categorization, clustering, conceptual comparison to the user's interests, and sentiment detection in multiple languages in near real time and producing these maps. And then the users just, if they found something in the map they cared about, could click down to the, uh, the support source for the, the information. We built much more ex involved applications in this, what we found was we could use LSI to good effect to actually monitor and control the workflow based on thresholds in the LSI space. So that turned out to be very important. And then another inter interesting aspect of this particular application, like a lot of the better applications we made, users made very few ad hoc queries. It was usually much more efficient for us to help them move through material based on following threads of entities or locations. Now, in working with these big collections, even the best of users need help. And over the years, we developed dozens of aids for analysts in working with the collections. This slide shows uh, five examples of that. On the upper left corner, there's a 
tracking application that we made where a user could track a topic through multiple documents in the collection. Second, and that turned out to be, it was very simple to do, but turned out to be quite useful. For the graph, well, we, as I said, we did entity extraction for virtually all the systems. In the LSI space, we've got all the relations. So for any object in the space, we can immediately generate a graph. So we had interfaces such that if a person's doing analysis, comes across a name they've never seen, they could just click on that name and display the connections of that person to other people or organizations, in other cases, things like uh, telephone numbers and email addresses and the like. And in terms of finding out where you are, what you're working towards in large collections, that was a big step forward, even though it was very easy to do. Now the next one, the gap identification, that was much more complicated. This was a customer that had very large collections of text and they had a number of problems they wanted to solve. And what they wanted us to do was to indicate to them automatically whether for a given problem, they had all the information they needed to address that problem. And they wanted us to identify gaps in their information. That turned out to be much more challenging. We worked on that for a long time, as in years. But the nice thing about doing each of these was, as we, as we solved each of these problems, it gave us more and more tools that we could use to attack future problems. In the lower left-hand corner, there's one of our entity interfaces. This is a pretty standard one, where if you had a name for a person, you could, they could just enter that name, and the interface would show all the variants of that name that occurred in the collection, and then a rank listing of the most closely associated people and locations, organizations, and then the degree of association of that individual with various topics, and then let them drill down to the sporting data. That turned out to be very valuable. In fact, in a more advanced version of the interface, we're able to do some pretty subtle things like uh, finding potential aliases for people. And finally, the map, this was done for a customer who was very interested in geospatial information. And they had people dealing with very large collections of data. And when, these, when these collections get to be really large, it's hard to even know how to start creating the right queries. What they want us to do was to use LSI to construct this representation of these tens of millions of relations and the transitive effects of all those relations and do a holistic analysis of that and say, if this is your interest area, then here are geographical locations you should pay attention to. And that type of guiding or predicting activity turned out to be very important. Now, I don't want to give the impression that everything that can be done with LSI has already been done. That's certainly not the case. There's a lot of current items of interest. I've given a few examples here. Uh, one, explainability of results. We have the same issue here that, that they have in all the AI areas now. <laughs> Deep learning. Both of the reviewers of the paper said they would be interested in seeing more discussion of how LSI relates to deep learning. Well, I would have liked to have done that. Of course, there wasn't space to do that, but that would be a very nice issue to address. Temporal issues. In that last slide where I showed the map, the whole year we were working on that project, each time we went to a higher level of sophistication of dealing with the geospatial data, I was thinking, we could do something analogous for temporal data. And customer didn't have the, the funding for that, but we never had a chance to do it. But that would be a very interesting thing to look at. And then collaboration spaces. We had one project where we were building a collaboration system for users to use across multiple agencies. And we built a large shared LSI space in which we represented all the data of interest and all the actions of the users. And that just opened up a world of possibilities. You could have one user in one organization had been collecting a set of names of people that she felt might be related to a problem, and another user in another organization had been collecting a set of organizations that he felt were related, and they could compare these two lists in the LSI space. They could say what people are associated with what organizations. Also, anyone who was starting to draft a report or even just taking notes could be immediately notified if somebody else in the system had done similar work, or perhaps solved the problem that they were heading towards. And finally, I'll end up here talking about combinations of data. I've only been talking about systems that process text, but there's nothing unique about text. LSI can work with any combination of events and observables. And we've worked with all these different types of media shown here. But the thing I want to point out is, in several of the later systems, we combine multiple media in a single representation space. And when you do that, it turns out, even though the media are treating the same topic, 
there's differences at the micro level in terms of how the relationships are structured and the strength of them. And when you combine them in this holistic way you can do with LSI, you get very interesting synergies. So this, I think, is really an area a lot could be done in. So in conclusion, there's a lot that's been done to improve LSI in the last 20 years. A lot of it's not that well known. There are existing commercial systems that are operating, doing analysis at a very high level of sophistication. But unfortunately, there's this big gap I've mentioned between the scale and the sophistication of LSI applications in current commercial systems and in the literature. And I hope with this paper and with this talk, I may have made some small contribution to helping to bridge that gap. Thank you.